Hello and welcome to Games with Garfield. I'm here with our regulars, Richard Garfield and Scaff Elias, as well as guests Tyler Bielman and Jimmy Heiserman, the creator of Quadradius, this new game that Richard is very excited about. You want to tell us about it? Yeah, uh, I found Quadradius uh, a few years ago, and it's just a web game. You can play it on the uh, on the internet. Just go to quadradius.com. It's a, an excellent game in an area which uh, really excites me, which is games which feel like paper games, but they're computer games. And it's a great game. It's got bluffing strategy. Uh, uh, soon after I uh, discovered it, I struck up a, a dialogue with, with Jimmy, and I'm really excited to have him here today and uh, can't wait to ask him some questions. Uh, Jimmy, so were you aiming towards being a game designer from the start? My main thing about game design was I liked watching people play things I created. I love sitting over someone's shoulder and not telling them what to do. And and just watching how they interact with something I created. And, and then when did, when did you get when did you develop the taste for that? Like, were you designing little board games at you know eight nine ten or did you um, later on? I remember, like I said, age thirteen, writing using only you know you only had access to like four colors on your TV screen with an external keyboard computer plugged in, and yeah, I would just write like poker type games and uh, guess the colors, spin the wheel, pick a number. Um, it's fun. <laughs> did you did you ever make any paper games? Any uh, table games, board games, card games? Um, I would I would skin games. I would take like Monopoly and then try to uh, <laughs> yeah. change the cards, the uh, the community chest and the the chance. other one, the chance, and then put up my own values for rent and what the things were. I don't really remember so much of making. I, I liked making things like scavenger hunts. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And I liked coming up with my own rule set. Um, I made some this one physical game that was kind of like uh, a, a tether pole, tether ball, but you would have four players stand around it with baseball bats and there'd be a soccer ball <laughs> tied inside of a basketball net. And so essentially you would take turns two versus two of trying to hit the soccer ball around the pole in one direction while the two opposing other guys try to hit it in the other direction and whoever could wrap it in the one direction won. So it's kind of like, like turbo tether ball. Yes. With, with with broken with, noses. Because <laughs> as you would start hitting the baseball bat uh, and, and so the soccer ball that would get tighter and tighter around, you'd have to all move in towards oh, the yeah. center. Oh, yeah. Well, I stopped yeah. with four people. So, so, I think yeah, you get that, eight around it's, there. It's, it's, it's kind of got that pinata feel. If everybody's wearing blindfolds <laughs> playing this game, now we got some action. Um, Excellent. So, uh, so you've always been a so you've always been a game guy. It's in your blood, and so you start making. Were there other little on, you know, computer games that you had made? Uh, I made one when I was like fourteen called The Face of Evil. It was one of those games where you uh, see a scene drawn of a of a room or a house, and then you type messages, open door, the text get, adventure kind. Yeah, of. Yeah. Um. Yeah. The uh, I I was related back to uh, Space Quest. And King's Quest, those are games I was playing at that time, so I tried to make my own with that. I made a game called Jim Ball, not a very creative title. It was number one for naming my games, uh, my name being Jim at the time, Jimmy. Uh, uh, even Quadradius was based on a game called Squares because it was a grid of squares. Uh, I would essentially have a file name, and then it, the file name would stick. Uh, <laughs> the marketing guys love that. Yeah. Actually, even Quadradius, the name came from... Uh, we heard that in Latin, and this might not even be correct, but I heard that in Latin for square was uh, Quadratus... And I love the idea that it tied back to the original game called Squares, and so we just took Quadratus and changed it a little bit and called it Quadradius and huh. Googled it, and made sure what didn't really exist as a word. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, you. Sort of mentioned that looking at like a trademark search, you had to have the Quadradius trademark. I have a copyright. Paid yeah. thirty bucks for it. Not quite sure what that means. Yeah. Copyright versus trademark versus registration. Yeah, that's there's a, a lot thing. of things that were above me uh, business wise. Yeah. So, but t- talk about sort of getting into it as an indie game developer. Sort of, you know, when did you decide you were going to do it? What did it? Cost? I decided. I decided it over a Christmas break, and so I started it where I had a good ten days straight to work on something, and then when school kicked back up, I actually just kept enjoying uh, working on it. So I worked on it for months on my own. Uh, and with my friend Brad doing the art and stuff, but programming wise uh, on my own. And once it got to the point where I had 10, 20 of my friends playing it, that kind of fueled me to keep going. Uh, and then we announced it a bunch of, when first time I saw strangers playing, it was even cooler. I remember walking into the library at school and seeing about 10, 15 laptops open up everyone playing my game because it was the thing to do when you didn't really want to have time, to, when you didn't really want to be studying for an upcoming <laughs> test. Yeah. How much does it, did it cost you? It's people, all it's main, you know. it's mainly time. It's 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 all about a a time and a skill investment. Uh, at this point, 
it's not so much a money investment because it's pretty easy to get going making your own really small casual indie game um once it becomes fun and gets a little bit more viral there might be more reason to add more money to take it farther or promote it or or invest with it but uh initially it's it time is the is the biggest factor so as long as you can find time to do it uh and an interest to do it then money's not really an issue in the beginning and um what do you do for a living? Is Quadradius, uh, is it a side thing? Is it your job? Quadradius is a side thing. Initially, I was working with ActionScript for my day job, getting better at it all the time for an actual career. So then taking that skill in the evening hours and weekends and working the game was pretty good. So I think getting a job that has some overlap in what you're doing with the game uh, helps a little bit because it, it helps you get better during your working hours. And then hour-wise, um, I probably put in a good four or five months I would say in two years of a side project uh, meaning total evenings and weekends so it was definitely having working like 60 hour a week you'd work 40 hours at your job and 20 plus hours at your game wow yeah that's impressive but uh, but it shows because it's a great game and congratulations on it thank you so speaking of the great game uh, I actually have a question for Richard what what first attracted uh, you to Quadradius what about it did you like well, uh, uh, before I get into that, I think I probably ought to describe the game in a little more detail for our listeners, since uh, I doubt they've all played the game. Um, Quadradius uh, is a game in which each player controls an army of something like 20 checkers, uh, and uh, you move those checkers on a, on a big old checkerboard, and uh, you try to land on the opponent's checkers and squash them, and, uh, and when you've wiped out all the opponent's checkers, you, you win the game. The uh, real interest in the game comes from these orbs which spawn randomly, and uh, and when you land on those orbs, you get a power, and your opponent doesn't know what the power is. And those powers can be all sorts of wacky things. They can be uh, they can they can be an activated ability. They can be uh, an activated ability that teleports your piece. They could be uh, something which makes your piece so it can't be jumped. They can make it so that you recruit all the orbs, all, all the enemy pieces around you. Um, uh, there's there's all sorts of things they can be. There's bluffing and uh, and strategy. Uh, uh, bluffing because you can try to behave as if you've gotten a powerful orb when you've gotten a weak one, or you've gotten a, a, an orb of one type when you've got one of another, and there's a lot of luck and a lot of strategy. That sounds like a, an unusual combination. I mean, a lot of people that like strategy games or think that they like strategy games uh, sometimes don't, don't like uh, luck so much. Yeah, um, well... There's a, my favorite games involve a lot of luck and and skill. Uh, a lot of people see them as opposites, as, as we've talked about uh, on this podcast in the past. Uh, um, but of course, poker is the sort of classic example. There's a lot of depth to poker, uh, but there's obviously a lot of luck. Anybody can win a hand or lose a hand. And and in the end, uh, even though people complain about the the luck in the game, um, uh, the good players will win way more often than the bad players. Um, even though uh, there is a lot of there, 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 that doesn't stop it from being a topic of uh, debate and uh, something a lot of people complain about. Wait, wait, wait! Is this what people are talking about when they talk about getting forbed? Oh yeah, uh, it what is. What does that mean anyway? Forbed. Um, well, we break it down. It's uh, f- by orbs. That's uh, when somebody uh, uh, gets a particularly bad distribution of uh, orbs, or or sometimes when they just get uh, a bad set of powers. This has led a lot of people to uh, to talk about trying to balance the game in uh, in a lot of different ways uh, to make it more even. For instance, uh, spread out where the orbs are going so that uh, people get a more equitable distribution, or make it so that uh, there's a set of powers uh, and and one person doesn't get too high uh, a concentration of good powers. But one of the problems also with uh, trying to bias things in one way or another is that these are things which uh, an advanced player can use to game the system. For example, you might throw more orbs towards the person with less quads, less uh, checkers, less pieces, um, as a naive measure of, of being ahead. But there's been plenty of times when I've been behind uh, and had more pieces. Um, more powers, you mean? Yeah, or both? More pieces, Sorry. but but I've actually been behind. And you start throwing more more powers to my opponent, and it would just get even worse. Right, And, when, and then it would further lead to uh, an abusive situation where the advanced player would understand this is the system, and then they start throwing away pieces because they want you to eat them so they can start... Which actually is a kind of mechanic going on now, which was out of my control, and it's a little sad. It's it, the goal is for it to be removed in an upcoming version. Uh, but 
once you run out of time of your game, uh, every second another one of your pieces die instead of the game actually just being instantly over. So what people have done is right off the start, right off the bat, they will let the timer run out, which is unfortunate, four minutes of doing nothing, and then the whole back row of them gets destroyed, and then they make a move. And what happened was they just opened up space for orbs to appear behind them and give them an, an advantage. Classy. Since strategically the game is more about capturing territory, territory. once you get into well, it, that gives you a bunch of territory. Yeah, let's talk about, let's uh, let's sort of transition into the actual gameplay itself and what, what the, the, the strategies are. Um, so you, you talk about the territories, and is it is that a primary... Is that a primary strategy? Is that a primary way to win? Is to control more of the board? I've always therefore felt Therefore, so. more of the orbs drop near your pieces? Is that a fair That's thing? what I... Uh, every time I teach someone new to play, that's what I usually promote initially. Uh, I don't know what you think. Absolutely. Um, and uh, and getting that sort of out thing out there to beginners is good because it, uh, ramping up to where they're, you know, uh, have an idea of what they're doing. It's more fun to play a game where you have some idea of what you're doing. And what you want to be doing is is capture, is trying to control, get a lot of area where you can get orb uh, even, power-ups. If even simply here. moving one piece forward pretty much means you have gained um, the ability to get to three tiles before they can. And so you've now offset it by, like, almost six tiles so you you've just you've kind of pushed them back six and my math might be off but the point is by just making one move forward you've gained more than just a tile advantage you've gained possibly a 10 to 15 percent uh squadron coverage than your opponent another another tip i would give to beginners is that is they shouldn't be fooled by having less pieces being a disadvantage i mean sometimes it is and obviously having few enough is but uh but you can only pick up one orb per turn so if you've got 25 percent of the board well controlled and your opponent has 75 percent of the board well controlled they'll be getting more orbs than you but not a radically large amount because they can only collect one per turn if they're going to keep pressure on you uh, i've seen beginners for instance pan just just panic when the jump proof guy comes out yes uh and and some some very good game players i know i taught to play the game and then they started playing and they said well my opponent got jump proof and i just basically gave up and it's a good piece but mm -hmm. the thing about jump proof i've noticed is uh, some of the beginning or, or middle players will focus on jump proof and they'll it's pretty much like a tank piece and they're going around very slowly one tile at a time trying to take out other pieces while if you just like let three or four or five of your pieces being gobbled up you can actually in that meantime be controlling territory moving forward advancing forward and getting ready for more orbs Right, and you should say that jump proof is it's a, a yeah. an enchantment on a piece basically, which makes it so that he can't be uh, stepped on by another piece. Can't be taken. Can't be taken. Except, right. So you can still kill it with special powers, and you can remove it with enchantment removers and things like that. Right, and there's enough answers in the environment that you can you can, you so you can mitigate it. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it's a good good piece, but not it, it, not, in, not invincible. If if a, if a beginner understands how to play against that they understand a lot about the game because uh, what it comes down to is that thing will be charging in and start start really threatening your pieces and as Jimmy said is like let the pieces go uh, collect you know use that opportunity to develop the rest of your position collect orbs every every time they jump on a piece they're not necessarily developing their position right interesting yeah that's a nice that's a nice balance uh, in speaking of balance in the last podcast we talked about balance we talked about the negative feedback loops and we've talked we talked about the idea that there are answers for things and sa stop gaps and safeguards so that nothing gets too out of control. How does that? How does the idea of balance factor into a game like this, where the power set is very random and the the drops are very random? Uh, do, do you feel like there's a sense of balance that that happens, or or is is every game so different that there's no sort of no sense of balance? I think the balance issue comes into concern when we add new powers to the game. We spent. Um, what was it? Every month of two thousand seven, two thousand eight, where we uh, every month we added um, a new power. We called it New Power Tuesday. First Tuesday of every month uh, at midnight, unless I slacked and it'd be a couple hours late, uh, ran into bugs. We would drop new power in the game, and people would have a rush to let's go test out this new power. And we would try to think through all the pros and cons of this new power and have it pretty balanced, even even so far as to. Uh, um, setting the probability of that power. Okay, if this power is too strong, well, we'll still use it. We'll just make it that it comes up less often. Uh, but then sometimes through testing, it would be... And we would do live testing. We would just throw it out there. That was some, some of the fun of the game. 
and people would report back that it, it, it was maybe a little bit unbalanced, so we would have to tweak its effect or its probability. So, so why does making it less common help the balance in that if I'm playing a game and it's less common so it doesn't come up, the balance hasn't been affected. But if I'm playing a game and it comes up, it could uh, overwhelm my game, so to speak. Yes. So, so does making it rarer actually help as a balancing tool? Or how do you, how do you see um, rarity as, as, bal- as helping balance? Probability setting might be more of a cop-out, but I've always felt that it definitely does help a little bit. I guess it might be one example where I would say you're right would be with um, smart bombs. Smart bombs is this, uh, this power that drops bombs across the whole arena, and it will never hurt you. It'll only hurt your opponent. And so what we've done is we just made the, the probability of that be very low. But even now, with working on a, a new version of this game, deciding what powers stay, what powers go, that power, even though it's so low in probability now, we kind of just want to axe it. We don't want it even in the game because even making it that rare, even when it comes up, it's it's almost unfun to get because you're just going to launch it whenever and destroy a part of your opponent. Yeah, it, that's, that's that's definitely the case, and, and that and that does illustrate what I what I'm talking about with rarity as a control is that that if I am in a game where it comes up. It affects things. Yes. Um, I was wondering where you, what you thought about the smart bomb because people were talking about whether it should be dropped or kept. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was kind of on the fence myself in that it's something that no matter how far behind, I feel like I can pick that up and it can turn things around. Mm-hmm. No, there still is a skill. You want to wait till your opponent has a lot of pieces. If, if they if they're pretty low, using smart bombs might not help that much. Yeah, you can't. It's hard. It's really hard to finish. Like it's best I've, to use it in the beginning of a game. Towards the end of the game, it's not really as effective. So let's talk about the spread of the the probability. How, what's the what's the most common versus the most rare? What is the probability curve? Uh, the most common is multiply because we've always felt that uh, a lot of this game is removing pieces throughout the game of destroying and and removing. But multiply is the the only way to um, add a piece back into gameplay. And that's the most common. Okay. So we made that most common. It actually is something like ten times as common as other powers, but. I didn't even know that. It still feels because there's so many powers. So many other that, powers that, that, that you don't it's really hard to tell it. that. Yeah. So I mean, get, can we quantify the sort of the curve, uh, like the, the the most common to the most rare? The most rare would be like a uh, like uh, smart, smart bomb. The thing is the most rare. Um, Should we create a center point and say, like, what's the? We've actually um, publicly um, posted the probability. Oh, is there too. a table? Okay. Yeah. Um, which I, I think I've is, had people analyze it and everything. I think is great. Uh, I've played a lot of games where people, uh, where the designers, like to keep things black box. Uh, I think uh, the amount of information you shared is good because, and and the black box into uh, uh, intuition, uh, the pull of the black box for the designer is that if they don't know how it works, then it'll sort of keep the game alive. But if you got faith that your game is actually good. That that uh, that then you can share all the information you like mm-hmm. and make it better. We had that sort of thing with magic in that uh, in that uh, at the beginning we wanted to keep the card list secret and we didn't want to have people publish their decks and things like that. But once we sort of embrace this idea, okay, we can't control the internet. You know, it's like the tournaments are gonna uh, gonna, uh, gonna gonna max out the, the 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 science on this. Is it still a good game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot. Of, I've I've worked with a lot of designers that want to keep things in the black box because they don't want people to know how little actual work goes into the actual games that get made. And they figure if they just they keep it behind the curtain, then people will never know, and they'll assume a lot more work is happening than really is. I might be guilty of that myself. So, uh, <laughs> so let's talk about: is there an aggressive game versus a defensive game? Does your power drop influence the the way that you're going to uh, take uh, sort of attack the middle game? Uh, yeah, uh, what powers come out is going to radically affect the game. It's one of the beautiful things about the game is that uh, it changes uh, each game. You you can't go in with one strategy. You've got to adapt yourself to what powers you get. And is there a, is there a defensive way to play as opposed to an offensive way? Is there? Yeah, I would I would think so. You can simply get jump proof and form a wall. You can you can try to put a, a trench in front of your opponent, which is essentially them not being able to to a certain point you can uh, do a moat where just if people are chasing you down you can put yourself up on a pedestal essentially and you create a moat around you where they can't get to you um, sit back and collect a lot of powers I don't know if that's so much defensive as opposed to just being uh, like sedentary 
One of the things that distinguishes, I think, the the better players from the uh, less better players, <laughs> if you will, is uh, the intermediate player, the beginner, certainly, will see orbs and collect orbs, and then they'll wait till get, they get combinations where they can use them, and then they'll use them. The more advanced player, if they're not getting the orbs, they're going to be keeping pressure on the opponent. They're going to constantly uh, be challenging, you know, starting border skirmishes where they'll th- put a feast piece forward and uh and threaten to take a piece and the opponent ha- and 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 you who've got all these delicious orbs to take will have to use up your time uh capturing this piece or uh or or, or defending it in some way and the longer you stall you make me waste time on that the more you have a chance of the orbs evening out uh and um i know that we've we've touched on one of your favorite mechanics that quad radius has which is the bluffing game uh, talk a little bit about that side of it. Even though I don't, I think there might even be a MySpace page still out there. But the one tagline we had up for that uh, for the game on that page was uh, "bluffing with a lower tile," and that was like this this tag we would go by, meaning um, it's the weakest power in the game. All it can do is um, lower the elevation of the tile that you're on, which is only handy for normally building steps to a lower piece who's stuck in a hole. But people would take a power like that, which for most people has no benefit, and they would charge with it. And they would run forward. They'd run towards uh, a guy who's also maybe powered up on an angle, on a 45 degree angle, which means he must have a radial destroyer, a radial recruit. I'm going to have to do nothing but backtrack. And all he has is a, he's bluffing with a lower tile. I don't know how to characterize the degree of bluffing in a game. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to uh, quantify. But, uh, but that was one of the things that I fell in love with first with Quadratus was how accessible bluffing was. It was if if... Beginners can bluff very, very quickly. Uh, that's not true in magic. Uh, there's bluffing in magic, but you have to be very good, and your opponent has to be very good also. Um, and uh, uh, but in quadradius, is very accessible, and it, it almost is in your face when you pick up a power, and you, uh, your opponent knows you have a power, and you you start you make an incidental move with that, and you see them pause. And then move another piece away, and you realize, oh, he thinks he thinks there's a threat. Oh, maybe I'll I'll use this a little bit. One of my favorite advanced bluffing techniques that I saw someone do, I didn't even realize. Again, this is why I love seeing that people took the game farther than I even imagined. Was uh, if you use a power that at that moment will actually have no effect, you would end up just losing it, and it would be unfortunate. We have this no effect safeguard built in, where um, if you try to raise a tile, but your tile's already raised to the max, it'll say no effect. Uh, if you try to do a destroy row. But there's no one in that row, uh, it, it'll fail silently. And, well, not silently, but it'll say no effect also. What people have done was they might have like a destroy row and a inhibit row or, or something even lesser. And they'll use inhibit row. You So now what happens is you, the opponent, you know what they have. They've given up their power. And then they'll later not attack your row and they'll think that, uh, well, they just have an inhibit row, so I don't have to worry about that because they didn't bother to use anything else against me. Uh, and then later they can they can pull it out later. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, another thing which uh, is actually a mechanic in the game which helps with the bluffing is that when you uh, touch your piece, that is when you click on it and begin to move somewhere, your opponent sees that and uh, it makes a little noise. And uh, it seems like a little graphic flourish, but it's actually quite useful to, to see your opponent begin to make a move and then pull back and decide to do something else. <laughs> right. um, and it really, I think it helps with the bluffing and with sort of reading your opponent. Um, I, I, I use it intentionally well, where, where my opponent will make this make a move, and I, I really don't want him to move that piece over there. And so I'll pick up a piece with a, with a, with, that's, that's, that's collected a tile that's got a power, and I'll stop, and then I'll put it back down. And and then I'll go do whatever it is. It might have it. Pr- it probably has garbage. And, but there's a lot of times where my opponent will stop moving that piece over there because he values it too much, and so he doesn't begin, uh, you know, making Richard, a. Ma- you are a right bastard. <laughs> How dare you, sir? How dare you manipulate people like that? So uh, was that intentional? Did uh, you? No, that that was an accident because mainly when you uh, click on a power. To, uh, to select the piece, you have to pick it up and drop it because we didn't want an, like, an additional click to get to the power one. We wanted to, whether you want to move the piece or to select the power, you want to do the same motion, a single click on the piece, just a quicker click. And what happens is, well, a click will always pick up a piece and drop it. So what happens now is your piece will do a simple hop yep. uh, when you're about to uh, show, even when you're bringing up the power menu. And we didn't think it was bad. We left it in, and 
and now became a, a, a bluffing mechanic. I love it. It's it's it ties in. There's a lot of other mechanics here, which sort of you use the meta game to sort of bluff more than just the position. But you you naturally take into account like how long they take to respond and and things mm-hmm. like that. But then there's also this aspect is like hey, he's moving over there. I just want to remind him of this piece over here. Yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, and. Uh, do you do that? Just got a curiosity, Richard. Do you do that when you play tabletop games? Like, if we were going to play chess, would you, would you intentionally bluff me that way? Or oh that yeah. So- oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. I mean, here it's a. Uh- it's it's cleaner here in some ways, uh, uh, but uh, but yeah. There's just a binary of, of I'm picking this piece up or I'm not. But with tabletop, you would be more like, do you look someone in the eye? Do you do you how do you grab it with your hand? Do you actually pick it up and put it back down? Right. Do you, hmm, you think, you touch your chin? Uh, yeah, so I want to so be able to... That's riffle. all missing. What I want to be able to do now with that by that thinking is when I play online poker, I should be able to like reach for my chips. Right? Exactly. That's the sort of thing that, it is. Where reach you for my that. chips and, and then go back and then look at my whole card again because obviously I don't know what my suits are if I'm looking at my whole cards again. Like all that psychology you get in poker um, that, that, that you're missing actually in online poker that, but you're getting here. That's... It's yeah. really great. No, and, and reading the time is really important, in particular also with like the uh, invisible pieces. That was that was just killing me against some of the better players that I'd be moving my invisible piece and I was playing against one person and, and it's like, so that my piece is wandering around, he's never in threat, never in threat, and the moment he moves next to a piece that he can capture, that piece captures him. And it was like, it was like ah, dude, how did you do that? And he goes, he paused. He's like, you're moving smoothly, moving smoothly. He knows what the one piece that's vulnerable is Mm -hmm. and what spot it's vulnerable from. And then click, move, and he captures. Oh, and I've used it against people. It feels great. (laughs) You're the werewolf. (laughs) Uh, That's awesome. Um, So one last sort of mechanical piece I wanted to touch on was this... um, the, the use of space and spatial positioning in the game. So it's a it has a, um, a metaphor of a 2D abstract strategy game. You've got this grid, uh, you're moving these little checker-like pieces around, um, but then the board will change in depth and height and things like that. How did you come up with that and was that um, something you had from the beginning? And, and how do people uh, react to that? Does anybody react you know, negatively to it because you're sort of breaking the metaphor. How, how, do, how does that look? What does that look like from your perspective? Actually, uh, it wasn't in the in- initial design. The game probably had uh, 20 or 30 powers in our own little in-house beta. And I wanted to make a power that could um, draw a wall between uh, pieces. And so I thought of just something that would essentially draw a two-plane wall, uh, like a curtain being dragged across, and then you couldn't cross it. And I didn't know how I really would be able to have have the user dictate where they wanted the wall to go in front of them or behind them and I thought well if I just make it that this whole row of tile could move up that would create a cliff or a wall or a trench or a hole and so I added this power um, uh, wall row column plateau uh, trench row column and moat and then the whole game brought on this whole new feel of 3D and and having steps and having pitfalls and I'm glad I added it because it would have just remained this 2D game and it kind of came like Two three months after development, have you um I you know when you said building a wall, I, I was reminded of Nightmare Chess, the Steve Jackson game. Have you seen Nightmare Chess? No. It's a, a essentially a deck of cards sits by the chessboard, and you have a hand of three cards in it. You can do things. It essentially gives you powers, um, and that you play those cards out of your hand, um, and it it takes basically all the strategy of chess and throws it out the window because you're playing a very random game, um, and. Um, one of the one of the cards that I remember having trouble with was the build a wall card because you had to figure out what were you going to use to physically represent the wall when you on the chessboard. Yeah, uh, uh, I was of mixed feelings at first with this uh, three dimensional uh, board, just because uh, it, it's hard often to to judge the heights. Uh, and that and that's not just a matter of this implementation. Just in games where there's five altitudes, that's going to be tough to to display. Uh, but but the amount it adds to the gameplay is 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 high. The variety of games you get because sometimes the game is played in its entirety on what amounts to a, just a just a two dimensional flat board. But other one other times it looks like a battle wasted crater landscape, and it's it's just very exciting the differences that can come up. Yeah, it's an incredibly dynamic game, and I can't wait to play a lot more of it. So when I when I when I first went there to the website, um, I sort of saw that there was a lobby with a couple people there, um, and um, and I know there's a members versus a not mem- versus a guest level. Um, can you just sort of de- 
describe what what the benefits of the membership are and and how does that work from a from a, a community standpoint uh, the the members version gives you more powers to play with uh, but when you play against a guest, uh, you don't have those powers to play with, so it stays fair across the whole gamut of the game. Uh, if a guest plays a guest or a guest plays a member, you have the same uh, restricted sub-power pool. And the probabilities are the same? Between? Yes, probabilities are the same. And then if a member plays a member, you now have these additional maybe 20-30% uh, more powers to play with that kind of then can change the outcome of a game. Uh, Do you add have a lot more complexity. the powers sort of into and out of the membership level? What we did, we do not anymore. When we first made the membership version uh, with these new powers, we wanted to also pull what we thought was one of the most fun powers from the guest version and remove it and let people talk about it what they're missing. And that was invisible. Invisible used to be a guest version. Went to the went to the dark side, and uh, I mainly did that because that was actually one of my most favorite powers. I remember back to uh, it's not really a comparison at all with gaming, but uh, I used to play Mortal Kombat, and I loved playing specifically as Reptile, because he could go invisible, and mm -hmm. it just added this dynamic to the game that I've wanted to kind of bring to this game. So now, that's, that's not where I would have expected that to <laughs> no. come from. Oh, that's kind um, of out of nowhere. Another awesome. weird out of nowhere was people asked me where did I get Tripwire from, which essentially is a power that a piece can make a move, but it has a bomb strap to it, so any move it makes will be successful, but then it will die afterwards, and I got that from... Uh, the sitting on the toilet scene of Lethal Weapon 2 when oh. David Weber <laughs> was strapped to the toilet. Nice. So. That's, uh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just talking a little bit about the benefits of membership, uh, so you have the, you have access to this larger player pool. Um, you can have a larger, you can have a longer name, sorry. which is more just a... Um, yeah. Um, a prestige uh, thing. Yeah. Right. And then you can have a, a ranking. There's monthly rankings on the who won more games uh Percentage-wise, so it seems a little bit more fair than just who played more. Uh, do you do any sort of? Do you ever do tournaments? Uh, we did not do uh, tur tournaments ourselves. We actually let the members run them. Um, oh, real quick, one of the other benefits was you can set up the initial size of the board and how many pieces are on each side. So there's a little bit more of a customization of the, of the initial uh, arena starting point. And what but, color you're playing? Oh, and what color you're playing? Yes, there's uh, six colors: a uh, uh, red, yellow, green, blue. Teal, purple. I'm yellow. I'm yellow too, actually. <laughs> and if you both pick the same color, you will be represented as another color to each other, even though you're both yellow when you play. Because otherwise, it would be a very confusing uh, game. Is there not a power that turns everybody the same color? It's no. a free for all. Everybody there was a bug that did that, pieces. though. There was a bug that would uh, leave you another color. But <laughs> no, so that. You mean a feature? <laughs> a disclosed feature that did that. So then you were just talking about the uh, the tournaments. We we have never made it that we control them. And there was talk of trying to bring that into uh, our control, which would be more so, so like the server control, so the server could output, you know, correct who really won and, and post to pages or give, you know, in-game awards. But um, the the members just kind of ran with it, and they would create their own rules, uh, how long the, the tournaments would be played for, how many people are allowed to be in it. Uh, they would name them. There was, you know, uh, King of Crimson and, and Winter... Bash, I don't remember all the names, but they would they would wrap their own metagames around this. They would be like, okay, we're going to play a game where uh, you cannot use any uh, any bombs. Right. Or you cannot use this. And so you would get the powers, but you simply, as a, as a rule between each other, you were not allowed to use these. Yeah, often a sign of a cool game when, when the players start to take ownership over it yeah. in that way. And you know you've created great tools and toys for people. And they would play kind of fairly where if someone were to use one of these powers during this game... They'd be like, "Well, that you just broke the rule of this tournament, and you you can't play anymore. Take yeah. your toys and go home." Self <laughs> self regulated. Uh, yeah, that's that's fantastic. So, um, how about on the uh, the technology side? So, you you're are are you a software developer now, or do you? I mean, how much of this is is are is your code? Um, all of it. I went to uh, I went to school for programming, learning uh, in high school at Pascal, and then C plus plus and Java later on. Um, the client. Uh, is written in Flash. Uh, is published for Flash Seven, which means it's written in ActionScript too, and the server side is written uh, in Java code. So that's really the gist of it. There's some small Perl stuff that behind the scenes on my own, like admin side, but it's primarily a uh, yeah ActionScript two based client and Java based server. And do you do all of it yourself? Do you have any any help at all? On, um, on, the, on, the on side? Quad Radius. 
Uh, yeah, the Quadra Eights itself was actually me and my friend Brad Kale, but Brad Kale is he's the art director and sound guy, so he makes the a lot of the animations, uh, a lot of the art and the look and feel to it, and then the sound effects. But he's not a programmer, and I'm not an artist, so it's it's a good That's good a nice, matchup. Nice relationship to have. Um, well, that's fantastic. Well, uh, anything else to, to close us up? Any last comments about Quad Radius? Uh, go play it right now. Uh, yeah. Richard, uh, what's, your, what's your username? Should we say hi to you? Shmoo. We... Say hi to me if you see Shmoo. Shmoo. I'll be a cheese guest for at least a little while till I get my membership up and running. Yeah, I, I, sh- I should point out that the guest, the guest, while the guests get less powers, the game is very good with just guest powers. Uh, it stands completely on its own. And we've always wanted to make a version where it didn't feel like you could only play for an hour or you uh, you had a, a, a unfair advantage. We, we understand there's a lot of people out there who just want to play a free internet flash game. And so we're glad to also offer both two so versions. Of the before people. we wrap, let's look into the crystal ball. What's in the future for Quad Radius? Is there anything you can talk about that is, uh, is uh, hot and up and coming and exciting? What, what's, what's, what does the future look like? Well, we've been working on uh, a bunch of us behind the scenes have been working on a bunch. A few of us behind the scenes have been working on Crimson, which is just the code name for not really a sequel to Quad Radius, but uh, in an, a, a large scale improvement. Uh, we're rewriting all the client code from scratch in ActionScript 3, publishing for Flash 9. Uh, the server, which was written in, I wrote it in Java. We're now trying to use an off the shelf um, SmartFox server where it already handles the concurrency and the connections, and you just write your own game logic behind it. It's very scalable. Uh, and we want to introduce the ability to play with up to six players at once in one arena. We want to be able to lose, uh, have a drop. <laughs> what, what are the negatives of the game now is a dropped connection where because if you actually lose your internet connection, you will then have to forfeit the game. It's unfortunate, but it's the way the, the structure was written. But this new version, uh, you can actually throw your computer out the window, put up another one quickly. And if your time is still running, get back into the game where you left off. Don't recommend you do that. Well, for a guy whose computers crash all the time, I, I greatly appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 let's get this done. So, we will see you all on quadradius.com shortly. On behalf of Richard Garfield. Till next time. Scaff Elias. Goodbye. Jimmy Heiserman. Battle on. And Tyler Bielman. May all your powers be smart bombs. And I'm Jessica Price, wishing you a good night.